you and, and welcome to our candidates. Thank you for joining us. Um, the Columbian Senatorial Board is pleased to welcome candidates for state, re state representative from the 49th District. And this is position two, I believe. Um, I'm Greg Jane, the editorial page editor and member of the editorial board. And I will allow the other editorial board members to introduce themselves. We'll start with Ben. Uh, ben Campbell, publisher of the Columbian and member of the editorial board. I'm Craig Brown. I'm the editor of the Columbian and a member of the editorial board. Hi, I'm Colleen Keller. I'm the assistant news editor and a member of the editorial board. And as mentioned, uh, we are recording this. We will post it unedited on our website and YouTube channel. And with that, I th oh, and we do have a reporter sitting in. Uh, she won't be asking questions in this forum, but may want to speak with you later and, and maybe writing a story about this meeting. Um, and with that, we'll get to the candidates. Uh, please take just one to, one to two mo minutes to introduce yourselves and explain a little about why you are running, and then we'll move on to specific policy questions. And we'll start with Monica. Thank you. Thanks for having um, an opportunity to share um, just our backgrounds and, and hopes for serving the people of the 49th in the legislature. I'm Monica Stonier. I represent the 49th district. I have also at one point in time served to the 17th district. I'm a mom of two. Um, I work for Evergreen Public Schools for over 20 years as a teacher and instructional coach there. In my legislative capacity, I certainly work on education issues, but also um, healthcare access issues, serve on both of those high capacity um, committees and also on appropriations. And I serve as the majority floor leader, which um, is a role where uh, determining the bills that come to the floor for a vote and uh, managing the debate on the floor is my um, prime responsibility during legislative session, along with some other leadership responsibilities. Um, and proud to have had the opportunity to serve the 49th in the past and, and hope to do that again. Great, thank you, and Jeremy. Yes, hi, my name is Jeremy Baker and I, um, I'm i running for the 49th Legislative District because uh, I've lived here my entire life in the, in the Pacific Northwest, Washington in general. Um, 33 out of my 46 years have been in this district and um, I, I decided to run this year because, you know, we have an issue, we have problems, and we need to bring balance back to our state. Uh, crime is too high, inflation is too high, and accountability is too low. I believe the families are the foundation of our society, and our society uh, has not focused enough on the family. And uh, in order to have a strong society, we need strong families, and that's why I'm running. I'm a father of four. I'm married to my high school sweetheart, and I have been focusing um, my my adult life on raising these four four boys into men and uh i decided to run because what good is it if i have four great men in this society and the society isn't ready or, or suitable for their participation so um in order to to do that uh, i am focusing on public safety we need to bring back law and order and uh soft on crime policies need to be reversed uh, we need to bring down the inflation and our attack on Fossil fuels has exacerbated the inflation issue, and uh, we need to bring accountability back. Our legislature has been controlled by the Democrats for a very long time, and it's time to bring balance back and so we can come together and do what's best for our citizens. I want to represent the 49th Legislative District, not special interests, and so that's where I get my funding, and that's where I get my support. And I'm thankful for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you, and thanks again to each of you for joining us. Um, let's start with the legislature had the state revenue forecast as routinely exceeded expectations. What should the legislature do with all of this available funding? And we'll start with Jeremy. Yeah, so last year um, the state legislature had $15 billion of uh, uh, excess revenues that they were not anticipating. And uh, at that time, inflation was 8.5%. And uh, the our leadership should have saw that we were definitely getting into a um, an inflation battle. And then we were losing control of that. And in, in, as leaders, we should have put in position, put in policies to reduce some of the burdens and regulations and the costs that uh, our everyday citizens uh, expect uh, to 
expect to get uh, in, in this world. So um, I think they should have been able to reduce some of these fees and reduce some of these regulations and, and try to uh, soften the blow of inflation. And so there, there needs to be a balance with um, the revenues and the budgets. I think the budget of the Washington State um, budget has nearly doubled in the last 10 years. And so I think we really need to come to grips with the, the, the size of our government and how much money we actually need and what is, is being spent on. Because uh, we're getting ready to get into some, some hard economic times and we need to have um, some realistic um, goals in order to uh, meet the needs of the people. Now, specifically, which fees, which regulation should be rolled back? Well, so the, our licensing fees are are, exacerb are constantly being raised. Uh, the, the Washington Move Ahead um, bill that was passed in 2022 um, definitely raised those fees. Um, the the regulations that um, burden the burden uh, the building industry and the economic issue economic issues like manufacturing and industry, where we have the regulations on what can and cannot be used for energy sources needs to be rolled back so we can actually have a, a broader base in our energy load so we can really have um, it, uh, so we can really bring in uh, industry and make them um, entice them to come work here. Instead of but then uh, moving forward, what should the legislature do with with excess revenue? With excess revenue, we should we should give it back to the people as much as possible. Obviously, we need to have some for when the revenue stream does not prove to be uh, uh, what is forecast. But that needs to be a percentage of of the overall budget. And that number, I don't know specifically, but that will be the what I will look at and when I become the state legislator. Okay, uh, Monica, what should uh, the legislature do with its revenue? Well, I think first we have to take into consideration the point in time we are in recovering from a global pandemic. A lot of the revenue that we saw in Washington state that was spent um, in our state and that we enjoyed um, a favorable forecast as a result of is because the federal government and the state did their best to try and keep people afloat while folks were not working. And uh, some of those revenues are not um, obviously not going to be in place down the road. So we have to see uh, how our economy uh, recovers coming out of, of the pandemic. And of course, um, if signs are signaling a, a recession, we have to be uh, careful heading into that. Um, the, I assume, Greg, your follow-up question is about um, if there's excess revenue. Uh, this last legislative uh, session, we did have um, money that we felt was import important to invest in one-time investments that would make the difference for people um, who were still working to recover. This last uh, week, I visited an in-home child care center. Um, we know that our businesses are struggling to stay afloat because people don't have affordable child care. And one of the barriers to people providing a variety of choices of care for their, um, for their kids is uh, the high cost of, of running that type of small business. So um, a lot of those one-time grants and that one-time spending went to things like um, making sure somebody can build a fence so they can open their licensed childcare and making sure that we could cover in the budget reductions um, that Mr. Baker just mentioned, like uh, my priority bill for the hospitality association, which reduced the liquor fees for our small businesses and catering businesses and restaurants around town. Um, so things like that, I think we, we certainly need to stay focused on uh, who the economy is working well for and who it's not working well for and, and bring that into balance. And when there is um, a more comfortable budget, I think we need to make sure we're balancing it out for everybody and everybody as would, possible. Would you favor, say, a reduction to the B&O tax or a gas tax holiday or some other sort of tax cut? Absolutely. The um, the tax structure work group is just completing their recommendations as you all, I, I think, participated. Um, there was a listening session by a bipartisan work group around the state. Um, and the, 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 the game rules were that you could not um, put a tax cut or a tax revenue increase into the structure, but their uh, job was to look at how the tax structure works across the board for everyone. And I think we're going to see some reforms come out of the recommendations from the tax structure work group, and we'll be taking serious look at that. We know that our B&O taxes are, um, are are heavy on our small businesses, and, and that requires some, um, some review, and that will um, 
I think the, the recommendations from the task force will inform our work in the legislature coming forward. So it, it, do you have a personal preference or are you just going to follow the recommendations of this work group? Well, I think I'm looking forward to hearing the business response to the tax structure work group recommendations. They were certainly involved in the input, but I'd like to see the response to those recommendations and, and take into consideration, again, where we are in this um, point in time coming out of a, of a pandemic and um, the strength of our, of our state economy as a whole. Okay, and we'll move on. Next topic, Craig. Sure. Uh, so as you both know, uh, education is the uh, main use of state tax uh, uh, dollars, K-12 education. Is the level of education spending uh, too much about right or uh, uh, too low? And uh, what would you advocate for? Um, starting with uh, uh, Monica, I guess. Sure. Uh, so, you know, the state legislature has increased um, the budget piece of the pie for K-12 education. It's been identified in our constitution as our paramount duty to make sure that every student is uh, well educated in the state. So I appreciate those investments. I think they have gone to um, help support our students in a number of ways that we were unable to in the past. One area that was left out of the McCleary decision that launched this reform was funding special education. And we know that that is an incredibly um, high uh, cost to our schools. Uh, many of other choices that parents have for their students' education do not have the special services funding that you can see in a public school setting, um, but that is not necessarily, uh, that's not necessarily funded in, at the state level, so, so we need to continue working on that. I do think that one of the challenge we, challenges we have is that a lot of our funding is unpredictable and inadequate in some cases. So I've been working on a pupil transportation reform bill, which just makes the, the money that's, that a uh, school district gets for a student's transportation is more predictable for those that are required to have transportation, kids like our foster youth and our homeless youth. Um, if we can make that more predictable, our districts can be better equipped to pay the bills um, for each school year. And so there's, there's some work to be done in the formulas to help districts as well. It doesn't always have to be a matter of increases. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, so yeah, education is actually one of the reasons why I got into this race. Um, the COVID pandemic really uh, affected, our, well, the COVID pandemic and the, our government's response to said pandemic uh, really affected my family. Like I said, I have four sons and um, two of which uh, suffered mightily, I would say, uh, did not do well in the, the, the Zoom environment. Um, uh, my, my my freshman, um, he he all he wants to do is play sports and and uh, talk with his friends and all that was taken away from him and I watched um, I watched his his desire to learn and his enthusiasm for life wane over time and eventually just basically gave, give up and he was failing all of his classes and so I asked the the school district at the time I said what what are we going to do is there is there a way that we can go ahead and let him do ninth grade over again because I mean we're not getting anywhere and they the the school district said that was not their policy they they do not allow any failure and um, so I took him out and I and I and I homeschooled him and I gave him the best education that he I can get him but uh, it wasn't what he deserved he deserved much better and I think that's that's the pre the position that I take uh, with education now uh, we we have thrown a lot of money at education um, um, there. It's about fourteen thousand dollars per student, give or take, depending on what school district you you live in. But we get disparate results. So, like the the district that Monica Miss Miss Stonier um, is participating in, Evergreen School District, they they have about fourteen thousand dollars per student, um, and the results of those of of that education is is dismal at best. I mean, twenty five percent in math and you know, um, a little bit better in reading and science, but the neighboring school district in Camas um, fares quite well. They spend a little bit more money, but they, their 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 test results are, are are much more robust. And so there's there is a there there needs to be a recognition that some schools don't work for all students, and we need to be able to provide a a a an ability for a parent and their their family to. Um, decide what's best for their kids and I think we need to bring in school choice to this conversation to make sure that uh, the money that is being spent uh, is spent in a way that uh, 
brings about the desired results. And if the schools are not giving the, the results required uh, that to bring our children, getting them ready for um, being productive members in society, we need to have options to, to rectify that. So would you uh, advocate then for spending uh, more state funds to give parents a robust option of school choice, or would you try to find the money from current school district and by cutting their budgets? Well, what I would like to do, um, I, I would like to look at all options, obviously, um, but I think I think a, a, a way to do it is to, with that $14,000, I mean, there's, there, there is an obvious that's a big sum of money. Um, I think what would be a, probably a good solution, and I don't know, I know there's definitely some bills that are being passed around in, in the house, um, but have not seen the light of day. But I think there's a way to compromise and where maybe a portion of the money goes towards the school, the home school, so they don't lose all the funding. But then we do give some money to the parents and the child, so they, they are able to um, offset some of the costs uh, associated with finding an alternative that best meets their family's needs. So by that, do you mean a voucher system where uh, that would help pay for use public money to help support private schools? Or what do you mean by school choice? Yeah, so like, um, so if there's $14,000, and I'm just this is just an idea that I have. I need to talk with uh, the, re the rest of the legislatures, uh, legislators and make sure that uh, what I'm saying makes sense. But I, my thought is if you have $14,000, why can't 7,000 of that go towards the home school? And then maybe 7,000 of it goes towards uh, maybe a voucher system or some sort of credit uh, um, um, where they can get reimbursed for the cost of uh, homeschooling or uh, uh, some co-op or private school, um, something like that, whatever meets this parents and the child's needs. That's really should be the focus is these, these children need, need to have a, a quality education and need, need, they need options and whatever, whatever is going to achieve that, uh, that's what I'm for. And I'm willing to work on both sides of the aisle. I really think that we really need to focus on this issue. So if I'm a taxpayer in a district yes. and a bunch of my taxes go towards public school, but you think that I should help pay somebody to homeschool their child when there's no oversight of the, how do I know they're getting a quality education? So At least with the public school, I can vote on the school board that oversees well, that. So the so what you're saying is that it's the school district's money, not the child's the, the the students money is that what you're saying mr, mr. I, i'm saying if i'm a taxpayer and if i don't have kids in public school it, it's my money and if i if some of that money goes to somebody who is homeschooling how do i know that homeschooled student is getting a good education well we need to have accountability at, at, at the homeschool level that is very important and then there are there are some guidelines for for that um, I think we need to be they should be subject to testing and uh, um, review absolutely we the, overall the, the the kids need a quality education if homeschool is that if that's the best way then that needs to that needs to happen but we need we do need to have some oversight over that for sure because we we don't want parents say i hey i'm going to teach my children and then come come to find out they they're not actually doing their job and so we there needs to be accountability i, I mean i'm a big proponent of accountability um, and we need to make sure it's we are accountable on all on all levels of society. The children need to be accountable, the parents need to be accountable, the, the schools need to be accountable, and government needs to be accountable. Okay. Uh, Craig, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, no. uh, Colleen? Uh, yeah, we are now approaching the end of the uh, emergency declarations that were imposed by the governor when the COVID pandemic hit. Uh, there has been some criticism of this, of course, over the past couple of years, that the legislature should have been given uh, an opportunity to be more involved in the decision making, timelines, et cetera. What is your position on that? Uh, Monica, let's start with you, please. Uh, thank you. Yes, I obviously heading into a, a scary environment like a virus that um, was um, would resulted in millions, you know, 
Americans dying all around the country and of course around the globe is re requires some drastic action. And I think our governor um, took that very seriously and uh, saved thousands of lives as a result of that. Now, the legislature did have a role in the process, and I know that um, many of my colleagues across the aisle did not think it was enough, and at times I shared that concern, um, but I don't think it's um, accurate to say that the legislature did not get a chance to weigh in. There were several opportunities for each of the four caucuses to find agreement and um, encourage the governor to extend or to roll back some of those um, policies and the restrictions that were in place. And when we could find agreement, we certainly did that. Um, so the, the legislature did have an opportunity to weigh in on those things. It got a little bit difficult for our business community in particular because they were never really sure when those rules were gonna be lifted or changed or adapted. And, and oftentimes that was because um, the partisanship of the environment got in the way of getting good information um, to the public. And I found myself frustrated at times when we were waiting to hear from the minority um, whether or not they were going to agree to approve something they had approved a month before in order to keep our businesses operating. Um, I know there were some calls to come to special session, but I think you all will recall how unpopular it is to the voters to come to special session. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do that if there's not agreement about what is going to happen once we get to town. And so I was not in support of um, coming together for a special session if we didn't have a plan that we could implement. And so, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of skepticism around how much of how much of the governor's um, policies and directives to us uh, were necessary. Um, but I am grateful that uh, we had people in our communities who were safe and, pro and were provided good guidance from our public health experts who should have been making those decisions and guidance recommendations along the way. Okay, uh, Jeremy. No, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry real ahead. quick, Monica. Uh, would you favor limiting the scope of the, the governor's emergency declarations? Should there be a time limit on it or should, should the legislature have more say once the emergency has been in place for a while? Well, I, I think there are limitations. The governor can only um, influence his power over what the Constitution allows. And so I think that was followed. And uh, I think the timelines are certainly up for debate. But um, in the conversations I've had with the governor's office, public uh, health was guiding those decisions. And that's who I think um, should have been doing it. Those, those are the folks that the epidemiologists and the folks that understand how viruses move their way through the public, understand how variations work and understand um, the depth of the impact in our community um, through all their, their different modeling are, are who should be helping us understand what we need to do as a community to keep each other safe and healthy um, as we recover from something like a pandemic or um, certainly in this case when we were in the midst of it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Colleen, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Jeremy, please. Yeah, so I, uh, to this to this question of should the legislature uh, be more actively involved in limiting the, the governor's uh, edicts, I, th I think that is a very important part of the legislature. I think that, that needs to happen. Um, Ms. Stonier talked about agreement, and I, I think that's why uh, my candidacy uh, brings a lot to the table because um, we need to bring balance back to um, the state legislature and, and to the state uh, government as a whole. And I think if, um, if we can bring in some people that have maybe differing viewpoints than the one party that has been in control for such a long time, I think that would really um, bring new new voices and new uh, new ideas to the table because um, we really were um, subjected to um, authoritarian um, uh, viewpoints um, and there wasn't a lot of open discourse um, and, and the messaging that was put out was one-sided at best and this happened in the state and also across the country and I think it's really important that we have open dialogue to make sure that when some when information comes out that we are able to um, bring in that new information and, and come up with new ideas and new hypotheses of why we are making these uh, things. And we really need to have a balance on what's best for our economy and what's best for our, our people. And I think we overstepped that. And 
to, to your question, Mr. Jane, I think it's very important to limit the time frame because uh, an emergency is an emergency for only so long. And eventually it needs to not, no longer be an emergency. Uh, the state legislature needs to step in and, and say, okay, this is, this is where we are and let's, let's, uh, let's limit these powers. Let's bring business back. Let's, let's get these kids back in school um, and let's do what's best for our, our uh, community and have that open dialogue. Um, there really was a lack of open dialogue and when things change, they just took away the information and let instead of talking about how that changed. Who You said they took away the information, who's they? Yeah, so um, the Clark County Public Health De Department used to used to track. So in 2022, um, the, the first part of this year, I tracked every weekly uh, data set that the Clark County Public Health Department put out. And for the first three months of this year, they tracked um, breakout cases and by vaccination status and a non-vaccinated status and who was getting the case, who was getting sick with COVID and who was not getting sick with COVID per the, per vaccinated and unvaccinated. And so they did that for the first three months. And then when, when that no longer fit the, uh, fit the stereotype, that fit the narrative that um, only people that were, get, that were vaccinated were getting sick, then they took, the, they took those, that piece of information out and no longer uh, um, separated the two. So when at, the, at March 17th on that week, when they, they quit doing that, 38% um, of the, the cases in Clark County were from the vaccinated population. 34% of the deaths were from the vaccinated population. That's an, that is an important piece of the information puzzle that we as a citizenry need to understand and know to, so we can better protect ourselves. And um, that wasn't done. And I think those types of situations really, um, really highlight the need to have more uh, more open discussion and more involvement by the state legislature so we can have these conversations instead of just one man making the decisions. Do you, do you believe that COVID vaccines have been safe and effective? Well, I think they helped out quite a bit, but I think it's not as it's not as advertised um, right now. They it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, um, you still are going to get it. And so with it being effective, I would say that, that that's probably not the case. Okay. Uh, Colleen, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure I, under, under, yeah, uh, if I said, to make sure I understand, Mr. Baker, that you said that Clark County Public Health deliberately withheld information about um, vaccine e efficacy uh, to advance a political narrative. Is, was that what you said? I wanted to make sure I understood that correctly. Well, I, I am not I'm not sure of their motivation. All I know is that they, they no longer differentiated from um, the first three months of this year and what they did after that, they no longer differentiated between the two. So I can't say that what their motivation is. All I can say is what I noticed. And that that information was very important. And I think it needed to be uh, continued to be uh, highlighted. I believe that was done deliberately then uh, for some, or do you think that there could have been some other reason? Well, I, I mean, I that would have to be a conversation with Dr. Melnick. I don't, I don't know why it was. It was definitely deliberate. Um, they, they deliberately did no, no longer put the information on the website. The reason for that, I don't know. Maybe it was too hard to track. Um, I, I don't know. But it looks like the the narrative. It looks like the narrative wasn't being met, and so that's why they took it down. But that could be completely false. And if we had an open conversation, we could understand that. And, uh, and I think that would be helpful for the community. Yeah, I just didn't want to uh, uh, understand that you were saying that they uh, deliberately uh, withheld that information in order to advance their political narrative, because that's what I thought I had heard. So you're not saying that then, is that? I'm, I'm, I'm saying I don't know what their motivation was. I'm always saying motivation. this is what they did. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, ben? Yes, uh, thank you both again for being here. Um, so election integrity is a topic that's been brought up a lot in this, in this election cycle and i'm curious to hear your thoughts on whether or not you think our elections are secure and just overall election integrity uh let's start with jeremy yeah oh thank you um 
That's a great question. Um, I this this is my first time in electoral politics. I mean, I've I have focused my life on other things, and so I I did take the opportunity during the primary election cycle to go down and visit Mr. Uh, Kimsey and his operation down there, and I was thoroughly impressed with uh, the security and the operation. It was um, it was very well done, and uh, to the point of election integrity. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I know that there's a lot of people in our community that uh, that have questions on inte the integrity of our election, and they are not sure of what's going on. And that trust is essential um, for our elections. And so that in and of itself is a problem. Um, the What I witnessed with uh, Mr. Kimsey, I, it looks to me like it's, everything's above board. But until, until uh, if I had access to more information, maybe I can make a different decision. I don't know. Um, that's just, I'm just a citizen at this point. Um, um, as a state legislator, I would work towards reestablishing the trust of our community um, and make sure that they are very, um, very secure in their belief that uh, their elect, their vote counts. That's essential for our, uh, our democracy. And that's what I would work towards. And how would you reestablish trust in the community? I think you have to have transparency, uh, open, open, an open dialogue, and you know answer their questions. Um, um, however, however uh, many they are, I think we just really need to answer the answer the questions and and be transparent. Um, I don't know if that has happened from the people that are very involved in election integrity. They would say it has not. Um, but I, I, like I said, I am not, um, I am not that involved. I am, I am running, running to be the state representative of the 49th legislative district right now. Thanks, uh, Monica. Yeah, I mean, I think this is maybe one of the areas where you can draw a clear distinction. I absolutely believe in the integrity of our election process. I, um, at one point in time, won my election by a recount, whereas, um, you know, uh, the auditor, Mr. Kimsey, brought my opponent and I into the office to kind of explain the process and to explain what was happening. That transparency and that answering of those questions, I think, was exactly the kind of trust that the public expects. Um, the calling into question the integrity of our elections is quite dangerous. I think we've seen the impacts of calling into question the integrity of institutions that have proven to be secure and that have been able to respond to questions and concerns and just because folks don't get the answer that they like at the end of an election result or from an inquiry does not necessarily mean that it's inaccurate or um, misrepresented. So, you know, one of the things that I remember very clearly um, from last year during the legislative session when questions came um, from the former um, governor candidate, for example, um, around our election integrity, both the minority leaders, Senator Braun um, from the Republican caucus and Representative um, J.T. Wilcox from the House Republican uh, Caucus, along with Kim Wyman, our Republican elected um, Secretary of State, talked about their confidence in the election process and um, believe the results of the, of the um, election. And to me, that is an example of people getting the answers that they need to the questions that they have and that the transparency is there. Um, I think that this dangerous um, calling into question of, in, of the integrity of an election process is what led to the dangerous activity on January 11th or January 6th. It's now being um, investigated. And I think this um, needs to be taken very seriously. You have to be really careful about whose judgment we call into, into question. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why many of those kind volunteers and public servants who volunteer their time to ensure election integrity were threatened and um, sec extra security was brought in for their own safety all around the country. We have, we have to be quite careful about, about that and whether or not our election process or our public health officials are feeding into a political narrative is something we really have to um, be mindful of because that has, that has sweeping impacts and very dangerous impacts for, for the safety of our community. Thank you. Uh, let's move on. Um, Jeremy, at the beginning, you mentioned a uh, rise in crime. Uh, what should the legislature do about that? And how do you balance effective policing uh, versus, and how do you prevent abusive policing? Yeah, so that, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, we need to reestablish law and order. So um, the, the state legislature and their, and their response to um, the, the 2020 uh, riots and whatnot um, really, I think, exacerbated um, 
exacerbated crime in our area. So the Senate Bill 5476, which is the state's response to the Blake uh, and state decision, um, effectively made um, drug prosecution, unprosecute, drug offenses unprosecutable. Uh, the first, first two offenses must uh, be uh, defer to alternative treatment and then the third and the remaining uh, any subsequent um, offenses were were encouraged to to uh, defer, defer to de alternative treatments and I think that that in and of itself has exacerbated the rise in crime so now our drug offenders are no longer they no longer have any consequences and so but it, it is is that the legislature's failing or yes. were they just following a court ruling they, they passed a law Senate bill 5476 that specifically said that the 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 prosecutors must offer alternative treatment and they and they are encouraged to offer alternative treatment uh, for all offenses third and over and the fact of the matter is there is no state uh, central database to track these things so that what what that that law did was basically made it unprosecutable so now that now our law enforcement community no longer arrests these people because they know that they're not going to be prosecuted and they are so they they don't waste their time and i think that that is a huge issue and we need to re make sure that that people understand that drugs are not legal here in the united in in washington state and so that's like that's the, the first that's just the first of many things that need to be addressed the house bill 1054 with pursuits um has has led to a dramatic increase from the moment that it was signed into law from March 2021 to March 2022, there was a 99% increase in auto thefts. That is transferring the responsibility of these crimes to the victim instead of the criminal because, because we are no longer pursuing auto thefts. The, the, the people know and Monica knows, Ms. Stonier knows that the the criminals understand this because she was quoted in a Colombian article saying it was bad messaging on the uh, the the law enforcement community on um, who is at fault and I would say it is the fault of the the state legislature by allowing um, these pursuits to go unpursued and and has led to people's cars being stolen and um, and the citizens being victimized and so we really need to to bring back law and order we need to bring back. Uh, the the police as the heroes that they are yes they need training that yes they need they need the resources uh to make them um um e effective but we really need to we really need to put this genie back in the bottle and i think it's going to take quite a bit of effort we can't just repeal all the laws that were passed we we really need to redouble our efforts to make sure that our communities are safe and so our our families can once again uh, live in peace and harmony. I mean, it's. I mean, I myself had my gas tank drilled out uh, a month ago because some guy wanted to get my gasoline and sell it for what? Who knows what? My guess is he now, wanted. At, it at, at the same time, do you have any concerns about abusive policing? How do we balance the two? Well, yes, we have to have we have to have great levels of training. We want to make sure. I think on a whole, our our. Our police officers are are noble and great men, and we want to make sure that men and women, excuse me, um, we need to make sure that they are supported. But yeah, if we have issues with people that are not doing their uh, their their due diligence and they're not performing in a in, in, in a way that we we require as uh, law enforcement uh, officers, yeah, we need to we need to have accountability for that. Like I said, we got to bring back accountability, and we have to understand that everybody is accountable in this situation. But for the most part, our law enforcement community um, are great. Um, they're good at their what their job at their job, um, and but they're leaving in droves because of the the climate that has been put in place here in Washington. Washington now has the lowest officer per capita in the nation, and that is not by accident. That is- Okay, no, I'm result. sorry, I need to stop you there. Let's go on to Monica. Monica, uh, are changes needed in policing and police oversight? Sure. Um, first, let's just be clear and accurate about what happened with the Blake decision. The court ruled that our sentencing um, was unconstitutional and that people were disproportionately impacted by our drug sentencing um, standards in Washington state and that the what people with drug with substance use disorders really needed was care and that's not happening in prison they do not get treatment in prison 
So absent the action. And the, I'm sorry, it, th this was a state Supreme Court ruling. State Supreme Court. Yeah. Okay, and this ruling ahead. came down towards the end of session. Absent action from the majority to pass the bill mentioned, all of those drug sentences would have been dissolved. So our responsibility was to put something in place to at least provide some guidance for those sentences to um, to, to be reevaluated by the courts, which is in state, which is stated in the bill, and to appoint a task force to assess the constitutionality of our of our drug sentencing laws. So now we've got time to do that. We've got a task force um, designed to do that work, and we can respond to the court ruling in a way that balances. Uh, the constitutionality of those sentencing practices with public safety. And so that work is underway. Um, this is this stopped, halted all action in the legislature to make sure we could get that bill passed and to make sure that all of those um, drug crimes were not fully dissolved. So again, absent the action of the majority party, uh, we would be in a much worse situation than we currently are when it comes to drug sentencing. Now, with regard to um, your question around, you know, accountability and training for our law enforcement, um, community, I think that is absolutely necessary. That's why I'm hoping to return to the legislature to continue working on a project along with um, the guidance of our new police chief here in Vancouver to bring a regional training facility here to Southwest Washington. Currently, people in our community who want to become law enforcement officers have to leave home for six weeks at least to Burien and just cannot do that. So we could have law, law enforcement um, workforce that reflects the people of color in our community, that reflects the neighborhoods in our community, if they didn't have to leave this community to get trained. And so that's one of the things that I hope to work on. Um, now, what, what about the, the thought that legislative action has tied the hands of police and has led to an increase in crime? Yeah, Mr. Baker references my quote in the paper, which I don't back away from, which is that when um, our law enforcement officers, particularly some of our elected county sheriffs, say things like, we cannot, because of the legislation passed, engage and arrest, when it's actually that they either would not or they don't have the workforce to respond appropriately. So the workforce is really the challenge here. Uh, there's no question that we went to the legislature with an intent to reevaluate the tactics used by police so that they did not continuously be used disproportionately against people of color in our community. Um, that was continuing to happen. Our LGBTQ youth living on the streets are disproportionately impacted by some of the tactics used by law enforcement. So the training that is necessary and the accountability to remove bad cops so that good cops can do their work is something I think we all can agree to, and including um, law enforcement officers that I that I talk to when I'm doing ride-alongs and when I'm working um, to stay in touch with them when we're passing legislation like this. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? I do want to just kind of yep. get back to this crime um, rate because I think that is okay. certainly top of mind for voters in the community. Um, we passed a bill uh, funding a. Uh, investigation and some research into the organized um, theft rings that have contributed to catalytic converter thefts and organized crime in and out of um, retail stores. Uh, there is a, a very sophisticated operation of organized retail theft that is going on and shutting that down um, is uh, not only necessary on the back end, but also uh, making sure that the, that information gets to law enforcement so they know what they're looking for is the goal of legislation passed this last session. But you mentioned, uh, uh, so that bill creates a task force. Wouldn't it be more effective and more direct to increase the penalties for such crimes? Do we really need more task force uh, task forces? Yeah, the question that question came up on the floor debate actually, and um, the the problem that we have is that the organizing of these theft rings is so sophisticated that we do have to get into how they are coming together, how they communicate, how they organize, and and disrupt that ring because they're sophisticated enough to get around um you know the the, the penalties um if 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 they're i don't think the the impact of the penalties is going to have is going to disrupt the ring okay uh is the board have any questions 
I, sure, uh, so it's a 20 year tradition to ask about the uh, I-5 bridge. <laughs> so uh, for our editorial board. So uh, what do you feel about the interstate bridge replacement uh, uh, program? And uh, is it on the right track? Uh, so uh, Jeremy, you want to take a crack at that answer? Oh, for sure. Yeah, so I, to be honest, I think it's, it's on the same track as it was uh, the last time this came up uh, over a decade ago it's uh doomed doomed for failure i think i think um we don't we need a new bridge but we need to focus on uh, increasing capacity um, we need a third or an alt another alternative route to get truck traffic off of the i-5 corridor so they're not going through downtown portland they just want to go up and down i-5 or hit 84 and make sure that that commerce is not impacted by the uh the traffic jams that happens day in and day out this this bridge that we're talking about now is just an, another iteration that adds maybe one or two lanes which does really nothing um in the next 50 years, we have to look long term, and I think what would be more appropriate would be to in increase uh, the the capacity by offering alternatives, um, a third bridge either to the east or to the west, or maybe both, um, so we can get uh, like a ring route around Portland, and so we're not going through the the bottlenecks that is uh, in that community, like in the Rose Rose Garden and what area, there's there's limits to the I-5 corridor. And so we need to look ahead and uh, provide alternatives in a way where we can get solve that problem first, and then we can get to the bridge. Yes, the bridge needs to be fixed, but let's let's fix uh, the, the traffic jams first and have an alternative before before we focus on that bridge. A third bridge first, as opposed to uh, an I five replacement first. Yes, sir. That's my that's my position on the subject. Okay, uh, Monica, how about you? I'm a I'm a little more optimistic. I think about um, the possibility of us getting a bridge here in the 49th district. The transportation chairs from the House and the Senate and um, DOT and Oregon legislators have been talking about uh, how important it is to get that done. We made it a project of statewide significance by bringing Republicans and Democrats from Southwest Washington together, all but one, um, joining to make sure that we could um, make the statement that this is important to prioritize. I hope we can stay on track with that collaboration because I think the community needs it. I think the state needs it and, and um, commerce needs it. Our business community needs it. Um, distracting that focus uh, with a third bridge that we don't have plan a plan or funding for at this point in time could slow the process down. So I hope we don't go down that route. Um, I do agree that the long-term goal should include uh, multiple crossings, but we can only make decisions on this side um, without the collaboration of the Oregon side. So you know we don't we don't legislate what Oregon does uh, on their side of the river. So we we have to stay very focused on where we have agreement, where we have priority. And right now that's the I-5 crossing. And, and again, I'm just, I'm grateful to the work of the bipartisan um, delegation over the last several years to bring the attention of Washington state legislators, the governor, the chairs of the committees um, to the importance of this bridge so that, you know, there's nowhere I go in Washington state where folks don't remind me that they're in support of our transportation project in this area, because they know we got to get that done if they want to move on to their own. Okay, thank you. Uh, real quick, um, let's see, let's, yeah, well, uh, how about a one sentence answer? I know it's a complex issue, but let's keep this short. Would you support a statewide ban on abortion, Jeremy? A statewide ban? No, I would not support a statewide ban. I am, I am pro-life and, uh, and I believe that life starts at conception, but that's my belief system and it's not, uh, a, a path that I want to go down to push my beliefs on someone else's. This is a very divisive issue, and I want to make sure that uh, we find a way to compromise uh, on on this because you know I think it's extreme to have um, state supported um, elective abortion up to the time of. Uh, of birth, I think I think there's a way we can bring in personal accountability to bring it on uh, this new child, this uh, this human being in the womb, and I think it's important to at one at some point in our society to recognize that that is a human being and that, that they deserve protection as well. Okay, thank you, Monica. Would no. you support a statewide ban? No, in fact, I support um, furthering those protections in our state constitution. Uh, I think the people of the state have spoken on that, and I think that um, our elected officials should follow suit. 
Um, I'd be concerned about the word elective because I think that's open to interpretation. And anytime we get in the way of life-saving medical care for anybody as um, policymakers and not leaving that to the, the patient and their um, medical team, I think we're um, treading into dangerous waters. Okay, thanks to both of you. Um, any other questions from the board? Uh, we'll move on then. Give us your final pitch uh, for why voters should support you and feel free to mention any notable endorsements that you like. And we'll start with Jeremy. Okay, I just wanted to touch bases on a little bit of some of the things that uh, Ms. Sonier was talking about. Um, so um, with the Blake and the Blake decision and their passing of that bill in 2021, they had tw the, the session of 2022 to address those those issues and it was it went undressed. It's still in a task force while our community is being uh, uh, victimized. I, I think her policies on uh, the third strike uh, law and reducing those sentences shows the soft on crime mentality of uh, the current legislature. And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, people like uh, Roy Russell, uh, who killed uh, Chelsea Harrison in 2005, two blocks from my house, is going to be resentenced because of the, the laws and bills that were passed through the state legislature. And, and I think we need to re-address these issues and not have um, a resentencing of these criminals and put these people back out on the streets. And so with with uh, with that being said, I think I'm an excellent candidate. I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran. Um, I, I am a father of four. I have I have worked. I know how hard it is to build a business and and have it thrive in Washington State. And I think that experience will bring a, a new set of voices, uh, a new perspective on our uh, legislature. And I think it, it's one that's going to be needed in hard times here coming up in in, in our economic situation that does not look rosy. So with that, I appreciate I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. And if everybody could just go on onto my website at vote Jeremy Baker 49, that's vote Jeremy Baker, the number 49.com. I would greatly appreciate your support. And real quick, what kind of business have you been? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I work in the heavy industrial uh, sector. So I fix paper mills, steel mills, cement plants. Um, so I, I go throughout the Pacific Northwest and uh, I make sure that the, our heavy industrial sector is able to make the things that we need as a society, rebar, cement, cardboard boxes, you name it. I fix those, those that infrastructure. And so okay, it's, thank it's you very a very much. niche market, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Monica, your final pitch. Thank you. Um, again, as I stated at the top of our interview, I appreciate the opportunity to have served the 49th Legislative District. I'm asking to do that again, to continue some of the work that um, I've started. You've already asked about a couple of the priorities like protecting abortion care and the I-5 crossing, so I won't um, touch on those, but I do wanna to continue to support our small businesses as they recover from um, the pandemic and, and get our small business community back on track. Um, I'm also working with the state treasurer, Mike Pellicciotti, on uh, the Washington Futures Fund, which I know you've talked with him about recently um, as a strategy to disrupt in, in, um, generational poverty in our state to alleviate some of the financial stress on the budget um, by just lifting people up and, and helping them get on their feet. Um, we talked a little bit about the work I'm doing to make school funding a bit more um, predictable and the formula is more usable for the school district so they can better provide for students. Um, but one other project that I'm, I'm hoping to continue working on is making um, in vitro um, care and IVF services um, more affordable so that it's not just the wealthy families who get to uh, think about how whether or not they want to expand their families. Um, I've recently joined the board for the Council for the Homeless to dig into the housing crisis that I can talk about on the House floor from um, the people with stories from people from our community, but I want to uh, understand the inner workings on the ground. So um, I've involved myself there. And then most recently, I've been very focused on ways to build a Southwest Washington shared services model for our uh, child care providers. Um, folks that want to care for children are often um, doing that work because of their love for children and not because they uh, have the, the skills and the resources to navigate um, regulations and um, business um, requirements for, for their home child care and centers. So I'm, I'm working in our region here to, to help bring that 
um, together and our business community has been very active in that. So I'm hopeful um, to return to Olympia so I can continue doing that work. And I wanna thank you all for the time. Great, and thank you very much. Thanks to both of you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you.